<laughs> cool. So now people should start coming in, allegedly. Oh, and it's started recording. Okay, that's good. Is it definitely recording to cloud? Doesn't say. I can't tell. There's a little image of a cloud next to. Oh yeah, there is. I don't know this if that's what that means. Fun for everyone to watch me going. Is it recording? <laughs> 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 cool, I can see people coming in now. Fab, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Da -da -da -da. Oh, and I've just seen Leone come in as well. Uh, I've unmuted you, Leone. So, there we go. All right, we'll just give it a couple more minutes for everyone to come in because these things, people tend to be a few minutes late. So, we'll just make sure that everyone has time to arrive. Hello everyone, hope you've had a nice bank holiday day in the sun it's been lovely <laughs> yes I, i've been having some real problems actually with my eyes so um i went for a drive to windsor castle how about everyone else i knew someone was going to make that joke <laughs> <laughs> i just posted it on our local whatsapp group and i said first down stay inside <laughs> <clears throat> i'm just testing my eyes by driving around the local streets <laughs> with your children in the back with your family on board do you know, yeah. do you know what one of my neighbours just said would you like to borrow some children <laughs> oh, Philly boots Philly car with children God, honestly yeah, amazing yeah um, no holes in that story then <laughs> <laughs> sounds totally legit <laughs> yeah I mean really I mean then the 17 year old uh, niece couldn't possibly have got on a train to come to London you know, because it's a well-known fact, anyone who's 17, they can't find their way, you know, to the corner shop and back. <laughs> what? Just complete crap. Really. <laughs> oh dear. My dogs have decided that they want to join the call about sustainability. Fine. I'm sure, I, I don't think anyone would be uh, uh, Okay. I think we'll kick off probably at five past. That should give everyone plenty of time to join um okay are we in a room for panelists to be joined by every, yeah so we are um, it's a bit um, unclear the, the attendees are all trickling in actually i'll say this now while people are coming in um everyone's coming in um and currently it's just the four of us that are visible um but the event is being recorded so it can go up on the young Fabians podcast and then down the line it will oh adam's just come back down the line it will also go up on the um young Fabian youtube channel um so as long as everyone is okay with that if you want to ask a question but you prefer not to um be on the video then that's fine you can just post it in the chat and i'll ask it for you um but otherwise when it comes to the q a portion of the event i'll unmute everyone I'll, I'll unmute the people who are asking the question and open their videos so that they can appear appear ask the question physically um so yeah okay. while, that bit of admin if you go while the speakers are talking if you'd like to ask questions you can go down at the bottom of the screen to the q a box you can post questions in there um, and the panelists can either answer it in the box or more likely I'll, I'll go to whoever asked the question and they can ask it themselves. It also has a function of everyone else being able to vote on the questions which they would like to be asked. So that is a way of democratically deciding what I'm going to ask. And then there's also the chat function, which is just for more general kind of comments and what have you, not necessarily questions. Um, I think that covers all the admin side of it. Uh, yeah, if there's any if there's any questions on the admin side of things, post that in the chat. Um, and I think we'll kick off. So thank you everyone for coming on this lovely evening. Um, we've caught, I've decided to organise this event kind of as a continuation of last week's event with Luke Pollard. I don't know if anyone um, has managed to attend both, um, but Luke Pollard came and spoke to the network, and he's the Shadow Secretary of State for Defra. Um, he spoke a lot about uh, how he thinks that food should be more focused on within that brief. Um, the things that tend to get talked about a lot are things like air pollution and biodiversity, and food can sometimes get a bit sidelined in that discussion. Uh, it's also one of my personal kind of, I also think that we on the left should be talking about a lot more 
um, both in terms of the environment and the climate impacts of what we eat, but also the ethical side of it. I think that's where we as Fabians and as Labour really have a lot to contribute. We can really come at it from both angles, about things like food poverty as well as talking about um, the rights of climate. So that's kind of the context of the discussion. Um, and I'm really pleased with the three speakers that we've got today. So thank all of you for giving up your evenings to come and talk to us. Um, for the sake of fairness, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Um, so first up, we've got Lily Chamberlain, who's from the Direct Action and Campaign Group Open Cages. Um, Open Cages campaigns um, to end factory farming in the UK and also across Europe. Um, and Lily works on their communications and kind of public affairs work for them. Um, next up, we've got Leonie Cooper, um, who's becoming a regular at Young Fabian events. So thank you, Leonie. Um, she's the Labour London Assembly member for Merton and Wandsworth. She's also the chair of the Assembly Economy Committee and the deputy chair of the Environment Committee. Um, Leonie recently released a report about the impact of food waste in London. So I'm sure we'll hear, um, hear some things about that too. Um, and then finally, we've got Anne Harrod Hopkinson, uh, who is from the Fair Trade Foundation, um, who I'm sure Fair Trade Foundation don't need any introduction. Um, but Anne Harrod specifically has been leading on their climate work um, in the last few months. So thank you very much for joining us speakers. Um, I just realised I meant to go in reverse alphabetical order and start with Anne Harrod. Sorry, I got mixed up. <laughs> um, so I'll go back to doing it in reverse alphabetical order and Harrod, um, if you don't mind kicking off, we'll do the normal kind of panel style format of five or ten minutes for each speaker and then we'll go to Q&A. As I said, if you've got any questions, post them in the Q&A box and then I'll come to you after that. So thank you very much. Take it away. Cool. Maybe you thought um, alphabetical order from first names? Yeah, I think that is what I meant to do. And then yeah. I was like, oh, I'm just sorry. <laughs> Well, that's okay. Um, so yeah, I'm sure that everyone knows what fair trade is, but just in case you can see the mark on most, what well, in most shops on chocolate bars, um, packets of coffee, tea, but also stuff like flowers and um, even gold now it has fair trade marks. So um, yeah, fair trade is the leading kind of ethical certification standard. And most people know it is, um, more of the human side and more of like the people focused, making sure that people are getting paid properly for the work that they produce. But it's not just about protecting farmers and workers around the world from exploitation in terms of finances, but it's also about sustainability and climate justice, because you can't look at these two issues in silos. Fair trade farmers are on the front line of the climate crisis. And as I'm sure you all know, it's the most marginalized in society who are the most vulnerable to climate impact. And this is in the UK and abroad. And those working in rural settings in poverty who produce many of the goods that we consume are some of these people. And farmers in developing nations are our key workers. So when you hear at the moment about uh, coronavirus key workers, you need to take account of the people who are making our food abroad because 10 to 15% of our food comes from developing countries and 50% comes from outside the UK. So think of them next time you're clapping is what I'm trying to say. And um, yeah, one of our main campaigns over the last few years has been about living incomes for cocoa farmers, specifically in West Africa. And these are people who earn about 75p a day, I think, and the living income in these areas is pound eighty six. So these people are in just desperate, desperate poverty. They can't afford to, you know, send their kids to school, get the food and the um, nutrients that they need. But we expect them to be able to do that, but also to be able to adapt to climate change and also mitigate their climate impacts. So for fair trade farmers working in cocoa, there's huge, huge, huge pressure to start deforesting the local areas because they live in really forested areas in West Africa. But obviously, we don't want them to do that. So there's huge climate impacts for that. But if they can't afford to make what they need on the land that they've got, then they quite often don't have any options. So this is where fair trade comes in. So we give them specific standards that they um, are required to meet. So like avoiding um, deforestation and making sure that they use water and um, other pesticides uh, sustainably. But we also ensure that they're getting paid sufficiently, that they can afford to do it. 
because there are many certification schemes out there that expect X, Y, and Z in terms of um, sustainability, but don't give them the uh, ability to actually do that without putting themselves into quite desperate situations. So for example, um, in chocolate, you'd often think that um, milk chocolate was more environmentally destructive than dark chocolate, but because cocoa is so often farmed on um, like deforested areas, dark chocolate is actually much worse for the environment, even though it's got no milk in it, which I always thought was quite a surprising fact. And yet 57% of the land cultivated for cocoa outside of certified sources comes from primary rainforest in West Africa. So yeah, just think about that kind of thing when you're buying. But yeah, so it's really important that people earn living incomes, not just so that they can provide the, their families with the standard of living that they need, but also that they can grow crops sustainably. And we have things that we love like chocolate or coffee for now and in the future. But obviously this is on top of um, the Virgin and coronavirus crisis, which um, hasn't hit the global south as hard as it has us yet. But we foresee it being a huge issue in um, societies and economies around the world that are more vulnerable to the shocks. They've got poorer healthcare systems. They live in situations that may have less sanitary provision. So we foresee this being like a really big issue. And it's really shown, I think already, the vulnerability of supply chains. So we need to look at this crisis and think, not just how can we solve this, what can we do to improve the sustainability of these supply chains by making sure that we're paying people properly, but what lessons can we learn from this crisis that we can apply to the climate crisis? So it's showing us the importance of global collective action and the fact that we can make big drastic decisions if we see it being necessary. So with coronavirus, obviously everything's been shut down. It's been really huge impacts, but that might be the scale of action that we need to tackle the climate crisis. And we need to make sure that we're willing and able to do that when it comes around. So when we look at building back better in recovering from this crisis, we need to make sure that living wages and incomes and investing in sustainability at the farm level is a part of that, because we can't just go back to normal. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I obviously totally agree with everything that you just said. And it's, and it is really interesting to hear about the work that fair trade is doing, which is an organization that almost all of us know, but kind of branching out into different areas um, and kind of keeping live as well to the big issues around coronavirus and the climate. I'm sure it won't be the last time in this discussion that coronavirus is mentioned. Yeah. I think, I think we need to develop a rule that everyone should put a pound in a pot every time we mention coronavirus and then we'll, donate it to a charity or something um because i'm sure it will come up again um thank you for that and harrod um i'll move on as promised next up if leone if you wouldn't mind giving your kind of five or ten minute um spiel sure thank you holly i think it's impossible not to um talk about the current situation that we find ourselves in um but in many ways that's partly because i think it's actually if, if this isn't the wake-up call that we need to sort ourselves out in terms of food, I don't know what is. Because one of the things that people keep talking about is, you know, what is driving um, the number of people who are dying from, uh, fr from this uh, pandemic. And of course it has been on everybody's risk registers, um, you know, national risk reg register, the London risk, risk register, but everyone's treated it as, it as if it was going to be a low likelihood, even after SARS and MERS. Um, and, and of course, you know, maybe even if it has a low likelihood, everybody always knew that the impact would be very, very big. And of course, one of the groups of people that have been massively impacted, it's not just about age, it's not just about whether you're from a BAME background, but it has also been the comorbidities. And the comorbidities that have been most associated with um, the virus are those that flow from obesity and I think are associated with people who have had poor diet and we have allowed ourselves to move to a position where not only are we hideously exploiting people around the globe as Agarad was just setting out but we also have the most um you know the number of people who exist on ready meals who can't cook from scratch or won't cook from scratch um who just want to have things that are hfss high in 
fat and salt and sugar and it's not good for us and we know that it's not good for us um you know we do need to be completely recalibrating what we're doing not just from farm to fork and making it much more local and seasonal and much more a plant-based diet and i hope we go into all of that a lot more but it's also what then happens when it gets to the fork or in some cases it doesn't even get to the fork it just goes straight to the bin now it's astonishing you know we're, we're, we're living in a world where there are some people who are starving and then there are some people who are eating all of the wrong things and are overweight but we're also chucking away food um, and the piece of research uh, in terms of what we just do in London alone, let alone the rest of the country, is that there are nearly two million tonnes of food wasted every year in London, which is worth an astonishing £2.5 billion. And without re realising it, every single household, or at least on average, um, chucks out 600 quid's worth of food. Uh, most of which is completely edible and therefore doesn't actually need to be thrown away, which is astonishing. All of this wasted food, apart from the fact that it's costing people money and some people could be eating it rather than going hungry, is also feeding into climate change and is having a devastating impact on the planet. Apart from the fact that we ought to be moving to a more plant-based diet, um, you know, we have this appalling situation where when the waste is being processed we're not even then using it properly in most cases we could be anaerobically digesting it and using it to produce green gas but a load of it ends up just being burnt in incinerators or in the worst case scenario ending up in landfill now you know we really need to be moving on from this we need to uh, make sure that we stop uh, throwing away so much food um, we also need to be really encouraging people towards healthy diets and the way that the mayor has been treated when he just said oh, well I'm going to ban adverts on the tube that feature high fat salt and sugar um, options um, the conservatives have really really attacked us in city hall over that and I completely support him on that um, the number of uh, children developing type 2 diabetes which literally never happened um, is, is partly linked to diet and also partly linked to a need to exercise more so we need to have some some goals and targets we can do this um, not just in London but nationally we need to be reducing our food waste we need to be moving over to much more local much more seasonable much more plant-based and we need to be doing that I don't know let's set goals of 20% reduction in food waste by 2025 and 50% reduction by 2030. That's what we need to be doing, and that also helps with climate change as well. I'll leave it there. Brilliant, thank you. And I think the other thing that that highlights is we know in the UK and in other Western countries that poor diet is also inextricably linked to food poverty, and we can see that with the rise in food banks and things like that under this Tory government as well. So part of it is people um people's lifestyles but a lot of the time it's not a choice as well um it's this it's the environment that we're in um we don't really in london have as many food deserts as they do in american cities which is whole areas where they they're, they're not within a mile of a supermarket selling affordable fresh food that's much more common in the us than it is here but it is still an issue with with access to fresh food um as well and also ethical food which brings me on to our final panelist which is lily from open cages um so yeah take it away lily thank you thanks very much thanks for uh, inviting me holly and the young fabians more broadly and um yeah it was really interesting to hear about uh what uh Fair trade is up to and um, also the sh absolutely shocking state of food waste uh, in the UK which is something I had no idea about whatsoever um, so thanks both for that. Um, so the sort of question we're considering today is how to create a sustainable and ethical food system and what Open Cages which is the organisation I work for as Holly's just said uh, would say is that a big point is that factory farming must not be in that future food system. It is not compatible with an ethical and sustainable approach to food at all. Um, the point of doing factory farming, uh, as many of you are probably aware, is to cut costs. And so far, uh, our current food system basically looks at costs in a very short-termist and very unfair kind of way. So it focuses on the kind of cost that we can see day to day in our economic system. It focuses on the cost to farmers to produce uh, meat and dairy, and it focuses on the immediate cost to consumers to buy that stuff. 
But what it doesn't take into account is the incredible costs that will be borne by future generations and is already being borne now um, of having to cope with the food system that um, sustains itself on immense animal suffering, for one, uh, on it, environmental devastation on a level which makes it one of the top causes of climate change um, and on human health impacts that we're only just getting a sense of now um, and dare I say I should put a pound in the jar because the coronavirus is one of these things I'm going to talk about. Um, so these are the main three points I'd like to make about how factory farming is not at all compatible with an ethical and sustainable food system. Uh, the first point uh, I made about, is about the environmental impact. Um, Basically, we, are, we have a food system right now where twice the space on this planet to, um, that is being spent on actually growing uh, food is being used to rear cattle, um, rear livestock um, to be used for meat. And of course, the immense level of deforestation that that requires to sustain such a food system um, doesn't even really need explaining. Um, the not only deforestation but also the incredible waste products from uh, a sort of factory farming system um, is a huge uh, cause of climate change um, and we're beginning to see the impact of this now but over future generations this is going to get even more uh, intense if we don't really radically reshape the way that we view kind of modern farming and um, we've got 60 years according to the UN basically until uh, the soil quality across the world is at a point where it's just not at all sustainable for us to continue um, using the current food system that we have. So we have a really limited amount of time to sort this out. Um, so not only are there alternatives in terms of reducing this environmental impact, I've seen we've got a question about how you can reduce your personal environmental impact by eating better. Um, not only are plant-based foods far more efficient in terms of the amount of protein uh, that they can provide for um, fewer hectares of deforestation and for fewer other environmental impacts. Um, but also these alternatives are becoming cheaper and easier to access than they've ever been before. So that's the point I'd make about the environment. Um, secondly, and I have to say this is the main point that my organisation Open Cages campaigns on, really the extent of animal suffering that is engendered by the current food system is enormous on a level where it's impossible for human empathy to even grasp the level of suffering that is going on. Uh, I've seen pictures and images, uh, pictures and video rather, from factory farms in this country that uh, would make somebody physically sick uh, to see the level of degradation and squalor that these animals are expected to live in. Um, you have more than a billion chickens, uh, chickens bred for meat specifically, being reared on factory farms every year. Um, and these chickens are dying in their own filth of heart attacks uh, in this, a space the size of less than an A4 piece of paper um, after only five to six weeks of horrible, uh, short, painful life behind them. Um, it is really, truly unacceptable. And if we think about the costs of factory farming, I think that surely must be taken into account. We shouldn't just be thinking about how much it costs for a farmer to produce a piece of meat. We should be thinking about whether the lives of those animals that go towards creating that piece of meat are worth living in the first place. Um, so this is really truly unacceptable for a moral society in the 21st century and this is happening in this country remember. Um, the regulations that we have in place are not sufficient to stop this level of extreme suffering. Uh, and then finally because I feel like I'm going on a bit I'm just going to quickly talk about the um, health impact of uh, factory farming as well. So uh, you might be thinking, okay, right, she's going to bring up the coronavirus, she said earlier, but what does that have to do with factory farming? It came from a wet market, right? Well, the point uh, behind the campaigns to close wet markets and the reason that people are drawing that link between the coronavirus and a wet market in Wuhan is because of the close proximity of different species of animals, but more importantly, individual animals to each other and to humans and the horrendous conditions in which those animals are kept. Um, the issue with, oh, I've just, we've got a question, we'll deal with that in a minute, I'm sure. Um, the issue with factory farming then, in view of uh, future pandemics, is that we have a lot of the same risk factors going on in a typical factory farm as we do on wet markets, which um, scientists believe led to the current pandemic. Um, we have 
uh, many individual animals cramped closely together um, in conditions that are not um, conducive to a healthy immune system uh, and also close to humans as well who obviously have to maintain these farms. It's a breeding ground, dare I say it, for deadly diseases and we've already seen some of the, the deadliest diseases in terms of fatality rate of this century and last century come out of uh, intensive farming. Um, so really for the sake of our, uh, for our future as humans and also for the sake of the future of animal kind, uh, we have to consider, uh, well, not only consider, but really strongly and soon implement a move away from factory farming entirely. And I'll just leave it there. Cool, thank you. Um, given that you just noticed it popped up, um, I am going to go straight to Chadney's question, if you don't mind. Um, so Chani, if you would like to, I think it's a really good question. I'm sure it's one that Lily gets asked all the time. So I'm going to unmute you, Chadney, if you'd like to come on and ask your question um, to everybody, if you'd like. Da -da -da. Unmute. Otherwise I can do it. I don't mind. No. Okay. Um, I'll just ask it. So Chani has said, um, can't more ethical regulations be put in place to make conditions in farms better rather than categorizing the concept as bad, given that it can be improved significantly? This is probably mainly a question for Lily, but if either of the other two panelists want to come in as well, then we'll go to, I'll go to them afterwards as well. Yeah, great. Um, thanks for, thanks for that question. Uh, it's a really interesting and important question as well, because I know that a lot of our food system today does rely on factory farming so we don't want to throw something out that actually on some level can work. Um, the fact is that there are already um, some regulations in place to try to limit not only the level of disease that's possible on current factory farms um, but also animal welfare. There are limited regulations in place but actually so part of the problem is this stuff is very hard to enforce. Um, the actual current uh, regulations state for example that um, sort of factory farms have to be visited by vets to check on the animals and in terms of investigation footage I have seen this just isn't a um, kind of a common thing that happens at all. Uh, the farms are getting away quite literally with murder. Um, so the existing legislation is hard to enforce. Secondly, um, I, I hope you will agree with me based on the argument that I've just set out that um, even if we were able to um, really put in place some regulations that were able to be better enforced, um, even sort of giving animals a bit more space and allowing them to engage in natural behaviours um, and reducing the risk of disease by reducing both antibiotic use um, and like those kind of terrible conditions that lead to animals having these impaired immune systems, um, then nonetheless, the that would make it not factory farming anymore, basically, is the main point that I would want to make. Not only would it make it not factory farming anymore, but if we were still defining it as factory farming, then the very, the very intrinsic elements of that system mean cruelty. They mean environmental impact. They mean uh, the risk of future pandemics. You can't have factory farming as it is defined without coming across those kind of issues, even with um, the best regulated kind of legislation in the world. As long as you've got that high stocking density, uh, as long as you've got so many animals kind of cramped together, um, as long as you've got uh, all of the environmental impacts that come with just the mass rearing and feeding of animals, um, you've got an unsustainable system, I would say. Does that, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, if anyone wants to respond to any of that, then, you know, as I've said, just put it in the chat and in the Q&A um, and we'll kind of keep the discussion going. I'm going to sort of slightly continue that, but broaden it a little bit so that the other two panellists can come in as well. Um, so your everyone in some way has spoken about changes to the food system to make it more ethical and sustainable um but we've also mentioned food poverty so how can we implement changes to the food system while still keeping prices of food affordable for the people that really need it that's kind of carrying on slightly the discussion with lily but also broadening it a little bit i don't know who wants to leone can come in Hi. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, and you, you mentioned that early and I think uh, earlier on, and I think it's one of the areas where, you know, we've, we, um, we don't do enough in terms of growing your own. 
um, I've got a, a WhatsApp group with a couple of friends of mine and I um, am usually too busy um, to do enough in my garden, but I've got quite a set of crops that I'm growing um, myself in my own garden. But um, there are a number of people who don't grow stuff in their garden and have quite a lot of space. And so I think there's a, a lot of value to the idea of um, uh, matching people up who want to grow foods with people who've got larger gardens that they're not using. And that actually, you know, anyone who's got an allotment, you know, you know that you will always get a glut as well. So also doing food swapping, I think, is a really good thing. So if you've grown, you know, when all the courgettes are all um, coming um, into season and they're all ready, then swapping some of those with someone else who's been growing tomatoes. So I think that really starts to tackle some of the food poverty issue and we've just not been doing enough of that we haven't had enough open spaces if you want to get an allotment in most london boroughs you'll probably have to wait four or five years currently to get one so i mean that's just ridiculous and there's lots of bits of open space that are just sort of prairies of grass that could be used even if all you're doing is using the edges of fields or the edges of paths so there's a lot more that we could do on that front um, and I think um, actually it's one of the questions in the Q&A that someone was asking about um, essentially saying you know I'd like to be a flexitarian and I think in many ways that is a really good way forward and if um, people move much more towards that and having a much more heavily plant-based diet but if they do want to still eat meat, I don't know, once a week or occasionally, that they then choose meat that they, it may be more expensive, but because you won't be eating it as often and you probably won't be wanting to waste it because it will probably be costing a bit more, but at least you know that it won't have been subject to um, the kind of treatment that Lily was just describing. So I think there's a lot more that we can do. And the more local and the more seasonally you eat, the cheaper it is. So you can address food poverty by being willing to eat seasonal foods as well as locally grown. So I think it's the combination of all of those things that we need to be looking for. Yeah, thank you. I think, um, I think, yeah, I think you're right that it is about tackling, tackling it from a lot of fronts, but particularly I'd be interested to hear Anne Harrod's take on the last thing you said around kind of local food because sort of by definition fair trade is an internationally focused organization um, so how do how does how does Anne Harrod see all those things kind of fitting together um, and also then with an angle to the the food poverty question um, yeah the local kind of versus fair trade argument is something that we have or get asked about a lot because I think people see um, food grown abroad is inherently less sustainable than food grown at home. And for a lot of um, the things that we eat and drink and kind of rely on, like coffee or tea, for example, you just can't grow that in this country. So, I mean, you can go local where possible, but there are some instances where it's not. But I think a really interesting example, and I know that this isn't a necessity, but um, flowers, for example, so we get a lot of our flowers in this country from East Africa, in particularly like Kenya, and flowers grown in Kenya are actually, I think it's four and a half times less carbon intensive, even taking into account the traveling, than those grown in the Netherlands, because in the Netherlands they're grown under like big heated um, uh, greenhouses and are less efficient than growing them under the heat of the sun. So yeah, it, it's always better to limit food miles where possible, but it's not the simple answer. It's not always the simple solution. Um, and then on the food poverty question, I think this also comes up quite a lot. Like you're often asked like, oh, it's more expensive to buy organic. It's more expensive to buy fair trade and I can't afford it. And it's like, that is an issue, but I don't think that it's the case that fair trade or organic has to be more expensive. Like for fair trade, for example, we're really big or we're gaining a lot of um, ground in um, some of the budget supermarkets like Lidl. And it, you can have like an own brand chocolate where you pay people properly for what they produce. And that's fine because with a chocolate bar, for example, I think it's 7% of what you pay goes to the farmer. So if that goes up by like, I don't know, 50p a day to the farmer's income, the impact on your chocolate bar is a couple of pence. It's really not that much. So it doesn't have to be a one or the other. 
And if you want sustainable food, and if you want food prices to remain low in the future, then you need to be investing in sustainable food now. You need to be having organic, you need to be going fair trade, you need to be making sure that you're paying enough now that we don't end up in a situation where there's not enough food in the future because of soil degradation, like Lily mentioned. Is it the case that fair trade and organic and things like that, the supermarkets charge more for them because they know that they can, because they know that people, to a large extent, some people who are willing and able will pay more and that if we made these things more common and more ubiquitous that then the price difference between your fair trade bananas and your non-fair trade bananas would would get less is that fair yeah i would say so i think quite often fair trade is seen as like a byword for like luxury or quality and i'm not going to say that's not the case because it is but um that's not that's the reason why a lot of luxury brands have gone for it to kind of differentiate themselves but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way i'm going to thank you guys um i'm going to go to um one of the questions from the chat um i'm going to go to jack um and i'll I'll mute you to ask your question i think it's a good time um to bring this in because it's it's really the thrust of jack's question is looking at innovative ways of being able to consume the things that we are now but differently and more sustainably so i'm going to bring i'm going to unmute you jack if you want to if you want to come in sure can you hear me yep Yeah, cool. Um, So a lot of the chat so far and a lot of the solutions we hear are around going more natural, um, organic food, locally, seasonably sourced and so on and so forth. Um, But in the sort of popular media, you quite often hear about new technologies, uh, GM crops, lab grown meat, uh, vertical farming, hydroponics, so on and so forth. Um, Do we consider any of those technologies to be part of a sustainable and ethical solution? Cool. Thank you, Jack. I'm going to go first to Leone because I know that um, the Environment Committee on the Assembly did some work about hydroponics and different ways of farming. So I'll bring you in on that. I think there's some interesting uh, work that's been uh, done in this field. And I've actually um, had uh, quite a lot of engagement with um, there's a whole group of people, a whole network called the Future Food Tech a network if you like and why tech um and i actually held a reception at city hall and all of the food and drink that was provided at the reception was stuff that people from different companies had provided um and but they were looking at in some ways it was it was tech based but in other ways it was very low tech um so they were looking into things like um how could you move away from um, putting liquids into plastic bottles and um, were putting liquids into algae and seaweed and then making them very thin and having sort of little pops of, um, uh, so it was like water that you could consume. Um, I said they might go down very well in nightclubs if they put vodka in them, but I don't think that was quite the market that they, that's not the market they told me they were aiming at anyway. Um, so uh and and they were also looking at you know how because a lot of insects also have uh, very high protein um and so they were also looking at you know could you make locusts for example which are very plentiful um something that is acceptable to to eat so i think looking into those and hydroponics and uh it is is acceptable the, the area that i have a huge concern over is um, where people have invented something and where they keep the IP, the intellectual property for a designed seed or a designed uh, animal to themselves and they patent it. And then if you want to grow the rice that is resistant to all of these different strains, um, they say, well, it's our rice. We made that particular strand of strain of rice. Um, and you've got to also then buy all of the, um, the, the uh, nutrients that will make it grow uh, best as well. And that you've, you can only buy that from us. So I do still have some uh, big concerns about high tech companies trying to patent things in that way um uh, and i'm quite nervous that we could then end up with um you know people being in hock to big companies who sell both the seeds and then um you know the things that make those seeds grow and and that is a worry and i'm very concerned about that 
Yeah, I agree. I can't remember which movie it is. Um, someone in the chat might remember, but there's a documentary about the big um, GMO using companies in America then suing their neighboring small holding farmers for, you know, to within an inch of their life. Um, so yeah, I totally agree that, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I also want to bring in Lily on that one because something that Jack mentioned was around um, kind of the fake meat type stuff, lab-based meat. Um, I don't know if that's something that you guys have looked at in open cages, encouraging companies to adopt that as a way of them being able to cut down on the amount of factory farming. Yeah, yeah, I was really, um, I was really excited to talk about this because I think this is a really, really um, exciting kind of industry that's just emerging. Uh, it seems like there's real demand uh, for clean meat and um, we're seeing a lot of really exciting uh, companies starting to want to take on the challenge of producing um, the best lab-grown lab meat possible. So yeah, it's really exciting. Um, Actually, the best organization to talk to about um, if, you, if you want to know more about clean meat and how, how it can be produced and how it can be um, mass made um, so that it's kind of not too expensive for you and, you know, how you can feel comfortable about, about eating it, then there's a really great organization called the Good Food Institute, um, which we work with and uh, are a big fan of in general. They, they work very effectively and obviously in this really uh high potential area so i'd really recommend uh looking them up um, because they're real experts on this topic um but as far as i'm concerned um clean meat could definitely be a big part of a future sustainable food system um it's really fascinating how uh technology is coming along to completely fill the hole left by uh real meat um without so many of the um the ethical or sustainable problems uh, involved there but yeah, I'd recommend you check out the Good Food Institute because they're the real experts on this. Will do, thank you. I think one of the concerns that people have around clean meat is, um, well, you're kind of touching on them being confident in eating it, but also there needs to be transparency in food labeling about what it is that people are actually consuming and making sure that they know, you know, what chemicals and techniques have been used, you know, that people aren't trying to pass off clean meat and lab meat as, as real meat um which brings me on to a question in the chat about labeling actually so this anon i'll read it out because the attendee was anonymous um it says hello everyone i want to be briefly anecdotal i have a close friend who regularly goes through her fridge and throws out everything that is even one day out of date what more can be done on general food labeling in order to target consumers so they understand properly when something's off preventing wastage and also can food labeling encourage more ethical and local consuming um so i think i'll go first to Anne harrod given that kind of fair trade is by definition a food labeling organization um, and if you've done any work on labeling um, more generally um, we haven't done that much on the out of date issue but i agree it's a really big problem i mean i go by the sniff test when I'm eating stuff. If you hummus and you think it's out of date, you can always tell by smelling it. Don't hold me to that. And that's not the official fair trade line, but um, that's my tip. That's not, that's not an official Young Fabian's line. Don't, don't start eating potentially bad food because Anne Harry told you to. <laughs> um, I would hope that you wouldn't. Um, yeah, so I do think that labeling holds a huge amount of power. Um, well, obviously the fair trade label is the most like recognized ethical certification brand in the UK. I think it's 93% of the British people recognize it, 82% trust it, and it shows that, you know, you can get cut through with these things. But I think there's been a proliferation of these um, ethical kind of certification labels, and there's been a dilution of what they mean and their value. So you see now that a lot of these um, companies are coming up with their own um, certification schemes like Mondelez who do um, Cadbury's chocolate have their um, Coco Life and then Nestle has Coco Plan and they do these own brand in-house certification schemes because they're much cheaper because they don't have a lot of the standards and a lot of the um, assurances that people are getting paid properly but they know that as long as they stick a label on there then um, people will assume that it's good and they'll buy it so it shows that there is a lot of power in these food labelings for ethical and local consuming as well, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's about making sure that when you look at a label, you don't just automatically trust it. You need to look into what it actually means because you, you can stick like little logos on anything and it can be somewhat meaningless in certain cases. So yeah, I think with Fairtrade, it's done a really good job because 
I mean, obviously people that I speak to tell me that they know what it is and they buy it, but it has been shown over the years, 25 years of the fair trade mark, and you couldn't imagine walking into a shop and not seeing it. And it's improved the lives of millions and millions of farmers around the world. I think it's over a billion pounds has been raised in fair trade premiums for farmers just from UK sales, which is a huge amount of money that's gone into communities and projects that have lifted people out of quite extreme poverty. Is the key point about that kind of almost like the integrity of the labelling, are there regulations that could be put in place to maintain that? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, what sets fair trade apart on the labelling is that we don't do our own um, monitoring of certified um, cooperatives and producers. We have um, Flosa, which is a separate organisation that does that for us, which means that we are that little bit more independent, whereas a lot of the in-house brands don't really have that. But yeah, there would definitely be value to having more like stringent criteria for what makes a brand but i think to be honest it would be better if we made sure that there was stronger uh legislation around human rights due diligence in the modern slavery act and it was applied to all companies across the board because there are some that know that they don't need these labels and will never sign up to them so it can't be an opt-in yeah i think that's a really good point um we've seen certainly in the case of healthy and unhealthy food, the fact that now companies are forced to have the traffic light system um, has meant that they've, you know, some companies have gone quite a long way to cleaning up their food. So I think that's a really good point about opt in and opt out. I think if I, if you don't mind, Leonie, I'll come to you on this question because it was kind of uh, pinned on the, on the wastage argument. So I don't know if you've got anything to say about the label. The yeah, I mean, it, it is really annoying. I mean, some people do sort of do a kind of like scorched earth policy um, around the fridge um and throw things out when they're sort of one one day overdue look i mean there are some foods that if they go off they can be dangerous to eat so um the food manufacturers have felt obliged to have some sort of system and you know they they do need to but i think for most things um you know going one day over i, I mean i yeah i'm exactly the same as um anger i use the um the snip test um and i will do that with you know not just with with yogurt but you know almost everything in my in my fridge um so i think that you know it's a shame it can't be restricted to the just to the foods that might be um you know problematic if you ate them when they were off um and um you know people also seem to confuse use by dates with best before and clearly you know I, I mean, I I get organic um, vegetables and fruit delivered and they sometimes seem to deliver way too many apples, for example. Well, if you put apples in the fridge, they're not going to be as great if you've had them in the fridge for, for two weeks as they might be if you ate them on the day when your veg box arrived. But there will be absolutely nothing wrong with them and they will taste equally delicious. Um, they just might, you know, not look as perfect as, as they were. So, uh, and I think there's a, there's a lot of difference between best before um, and using a fridge properly. I mean, in some ways we have all become addicted to our, um, you know, the, the question about, um, you know, technology. Um, you know, the fridge has been one of the inventions that has helped us move from where we used to be. You know, the, the way to keep food fresh for half the year um, in times past was either to have some sort of um, you know pit that you dug in the ground and buried it and hoped that it stayed fresh um, or you salted it from here to eternity and then hoped it didn't go off uh, and, and hope that you could still eat it so uh, I, th I think if we do move much more towards a plant-based diet um, you know I think uh, I think people will be surprised by how long um, plant-based food lasts much more than um you know meat i think does go off much more quickly um and also there are some cheeses which you do have to be careful with as well yeah yeah very true don't just eat <laughs> don't just eat everything <laughs> if it's out of date make sure that you're using some common sense um lily are there any examples um from your line of work i should just mention actually um the environment networks theme for this year is around accountability and it seems to me that imperfect as it is labeling is a way of introducing some level of accountability to these organizations so this is all very prescient to kind of the, the theme of the discussions that we're having this um this year or all year um but lily are there any examples in your industry of of labeling schemes or do you think it could be beneficial to have labeling schemes i'm thinking about free range 
but we also hear that free range is very imperfect and actually free range doesn't always mean what people think it means so your kind of reflections on that yeah 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 it's a really good point and um yeah the kind of labeling that i'd like to talk about is specifically to do with welfare because it's the one that i know the most about um so not so much in labeling but in terms of uh general kind of um conceptualizing of the welfare of um say chickens for example um chickens reared for me who are also known as uh, broiler chickens um there are certain different levels of standard that are typically spoken about um, and those will include red tractor chicken, which is one that you will uh, often see on your packaging. Uh, I don't think it's mandated to have it on there, but it's a nice sort of uh, brands do use that as a way of saying, oh, look, we've got high welfare, high welfare, good, uh, good chicken. Um, so red tractor. There's also RSPCA assured chicken as another level, the step up that people talk about. Um, but then now um, there is in fact uh, a higher welfare standard um, which we at Open Cages would consider the only one that's uh, approaching acceptable um, which we now encourage uh, companies to take on uh, which is called the Better Chicken Commitment or the European Chicken Commitment um, and this is basically a list of uh, optional currently regulations um, for companies um, to adopt uh, when in terms of the production of gorilla chicken. Uh, it includes such things as a maximum stocking density. Stocking density, by the way, uh, is how many birds you can have in a certain size space, basically. So it's how crammed together they are or not. Um, so stocking density, the breed of chicken uh, that you're allowed to rear and, and use for meat, that's very important because uh, the kind of breeds that um, big companies like, tend to like to go for uh, are breeds that grow very big, very fast, um, to the point where you get the kind of problems that I talked about earlier, where um, they will live very short lives, even if they're not slaughtered before then, and um, suffer a lot of health problems, bone problems, uh, etc. Um, so the Better Chicken Commitment uh, tells companies to um, adopt uh, breeds with higher welfare in of themselves so they're not doomed by their own genetics um, and other things like that allowing the birds to engage in some basic natural behaviors like perching um, dust bathing uh, which if they can't do them can cause immense stress in the animals so the better chicken commitment is a level much higher even than RSPCA assured which you will see sometimes on your packaging you will hear that term um, but the one that really you should be looking into if you want to aim for the highest uh, welfare possible is uh, the better chicken commitment um, and to come back to the point of on aff affordability as well because I know this is something that people worry about when thinking about alternatives to worse kinds of factory farming um, this better chicken commitment has been adopted by a range of massive brands already from KFC uh, to Marks and Spencer I believe if I'm remembering that rightly kind of a real range uh, Pret-a-Manger range of different massive brands um, have been able to adopt it um, without a noticeable difference in price um, and really the kind of pressure being put on these brands to adopt um, better standards of welfare is such um, that they will make it work for their consumer. They're very concerned about price. Um, so the fact that this is already happening and this is a shift that you probably haven't even noticed, um, it certainly sets us up in good stead for a sort of future food which doesn't rely on the very worst types of factory farming. So just to kind of circle back, kind of in terms of labelling, the standard of welfare that you should be looking at really is this better chicken commitment, um, more even than Red Tractor and RSVCA assured. And that's all I know about labelling. I don't know anything about whether food is off. <laughs> I'd probably also use the sniff test, um, but I don't eat a very big variety of foods. So I'm not sure how relevant that is. That's really relevant for everyone to hear, isn't it? <laughs> No, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> I think, um, I, to be honest, I think to go on my little, uh, my little podium speech, the fact that big companies can adopt these standards without the prices necessarily going up that much. And Harrod said the same thing about fair trade. To my mind, it just shows actually the dominance of the big supermarkets um squeezing you know squeezing the incomes for the for farmers that fair trade works with squeezing the incomes of dairy farmers in the uk many of whom operate on a loss almost 100 percent of the time you know literally squeezing chickens into really really horrible horrible conditions um while these companies still make a massive profit 
Um, so actually, in my mind, it is possible, very, very possible to have both affordability and ethics and sustainability if we had a government that was willing to crack down a little bit on the dominance of, of large supermarket chains in the industry and the way that they treat their supply chain is absolutely diabolical, in my opinion, to be honest with you. But that's my little podium speech over. You're not here to, you're not here to hear from me. Um, but continuing on the theme of um, affordability, if it's okay, I'd like to bring in Laura, because you've got a question about other ways um, that affordability, affordability could be ensured in the system. So I'm just going to unmute you, Laura, if you want to come in and ask your, your question. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fab. Um, so my question was sort of following on from what Leonie mentioned earlier about the campaign on the tube to remove advertising for unhealthy food. Um, should something more widespread be introduced to encourage behavioural change, particularly for families on a lower income that are sort of priced out of plant based healthier food as the system functions at the moment to sort of ensure that more people across the UK have access to a more nutritious diet and also that they're encouraged to follow one? Cool. Thank you, Laura. Anyone can jump in on that uh, if anyone wants to. Yeah, I think there's been a, a real problem with um, what's the, you know, the public, the budget for what's called public health. And so we've also had uh, a problem with the number of people who uh, turn up in hospitals and actually become ill from the kind of food that they're eating. So um, and I think it, you know, and I do think this is going to have to be one of the really big changes. Um, a lot of times you hear people talking about, oh, you know, we, we focus on the National Health Service. We don't do enough about social care. We also focus on fixing up people after they've got ill rather than helping them lead a life that includes preventing them from becoming ill in the first place. And food um, is wonderful, but it, it, sh it can also make us unwell. You know, and the very obvious examples are, you know, if you drink too much, it doesn't do your liver very much good. Um, if you smoke too much, obviously that's not food, but, you know, that's not going to do you much good either. But then the issues about um, the high fat, salt and sugar in people's diets, we do really need to tackle that in a way that we haven't done up until now. And when public health was um, removed and given to local authorities, um, it was used as an, uh, one of those many occasions when um, the responsibility for that area was transferred, but the money to enable local authorities to really engage with people did not transfer as well. And so um, it's always been a bit of a Cinderella service. And it's also something that really needs to be addressed um, across a number of different communities. Um, and, you, and you need people, so as one of my dogs has decided to join in, if you can hear a sort of little yip going on. Um, you know, because you, you actually need to, um, uh, uh, the public health agenda only really works if you get um, peer to peer discussion of changes to people's diets, because quite often it is hard to say to people, don't use butter, don't use ghee, don't you, you know, you need to move to using something else. Why don't you think about not frying as much? Why don't, you know, getting people to actually think about like, transforming their diet is it's sometimes very bound up with individuals' culture and sense of identity. But moving us all to a place where we eat healthily and are much more uh, willing to have that fresh food and it will just be quite transformative and that's one of the many ways in which we can all help ourselves but also help the national health service and preventing ill health then means that you know if you are going to lead, lead a life until you're 60 70 80 90 100 um colonel sir tom um you know having a really good diet has to be a serious underpinning of that yeah, it does. And I think you're 100% right to raise the cuts to public health, which have totally just decimated all of the things you mentioned, stopping smoking, cutting down on drinking as well. Um, I think I just want to bring in some of the comments that Chanley's putting in the chat, because I think they're 100% um, relevant to this discussion. Um, I think Chanley was having trouble. I'm going to unmute you for a second, Chanley, to see if you can come in. I know you're having trouble with that earlier. Um, no, I'm just going to read out uh, the comment that Chanley put in a moment ago, which is sometimes having a diet that isn't necessarily nutritious isn't completely due to a lack of education and understanding. Often blue collar workers or poorer individuals may work longer hours, earn less or could have single parent households and opting for fast food is easier. 
we all can relate to that, I think, to some extent. Um, additionally, to improve income inequality and health, why not encourage people to eat more fruit and veg by making it cheaper, subsidizing it or offering vouchers rather than taxing sweets and sugary foods. Incentivize people to eat more healthily by helping people to do so rather than profit more from lower income people that may consume them more. Um, I know all the panelists and myself and probably everyone in the call 100% agrees with everything that Chandni said. So thank you for all of your comments, Chandni. They're really, really helpful. I am going to try and make sure that we can capture all of these comments as well and maybe put them in like a blog post or something so that we can kind of keep this discussion going. Um, but just on what Chandni's saying, I don't know if Lily or Anne Harrod want to come in on, on any of those points. Um, nothing to add apart from that I agree that subsidising fruit and veg obviously is a really good decision in subsidising rather than expecting those prices to be lower because just because they're necessities and we need them doesn't mean that the farmers who are growing them can live off lower wages so yeah I agree. Yeah me too I just agree yeah good point well made. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so and people are saying thank you, Chandi. Thank you, Chandi. I agree. Um, I will then come to the question that was in the Q&A box. It was also from an anonymous attendee. Um, with an eye to everything that Chandni has so well been saying in the chat about, about affordability, um, someone has asked, good evening panellists, I personally am still a meat eater, preferring to eat seafood regularly and meat only as a treat. Given a hypothetical that I am not willing to switch to solely veggie yet, which to be honest is probably the position of almost everybody, um, whenever it is possible I always make sure to eat free range, organic meat, etc. But what more can I do to make sure my eating habits are good for the environment? Um, like I said, with an eye to all the comments that, that Chani has been putting in and, and others have been saying about affordability and food poverty as well. Anyone can come in. Yeah, it seems like um, it seems like it really fits well with the sort of stuff that I do. Uh, first of all, uh, well done for kind of cutting down your meat consumption, it kind of seems like and kind of you're really thinking about your diet, which is amazing. Um, I'm really not one of those people and no one in my organization is one of those people who's all about sort of perfect veganism needing to be important or even perfect vegetarianism. Um, we completely acknowledge uh, the sort of the fact that, you know, privilege makes it a lot easier for some people to adopt a certain diet um, than others and it's just great for you to be really thinking critically about what you eat and how you can um, how you can make your diet as good for the environment and for the animals as possible so that's that's really awesome um generally i think the direction you're going in so that speaking purely from my area of expertise because i know this is going to be layered on by everyone else um, in a way that's going to give a much fuller picture so i'm just going to talk about in terms of diet um, and in terms of meat, uh, I think the direction that you're going in or the, the way that you've already um, adjusted your diet is great. Uh, and I think, you know, that makes more of, of a difference than you may even realize. Um, it's really good to just even be able to show big brands um, that you uh, will be part of the audience for any future vegetarian uh, or fully plant based options. Um, that they introduce. So you've seen a huge wave of new plant-based products um, over the last couple of years that have been received extremely well by UK consumers. And then, of course, lo and behold, um, more brands are bringing them out, making it easier than ever for anyone, regardless of their background, um, to eat more plant-based um, and therefore sort of really reduce their impact on, on the environment and uh, negative impact on animal welfare as well. Um, so... The, that's the sort of main point that I'd give because I feel like this, the meat is one element of it, but I feel like there are other big elements of this that are better going to be addressed by everyone else. So I'll just leave that there. And well done, anonymous attendee, for thinking critically about your diet. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, I think on Lily's right that even small changes actually can make a big difference. I'm often skeptical of environmental movements which do put the onus on individuals to change their behavior. Things like plastic straws, I often think we'd actually be a lot better if we did target the big companies um, to make changes. But actually food is one of the areas where just cutting down a little bit does make a big difference, particularly in terms of carbon. Carbon, when it's released into the atmosphere, a ton of carbon released into the atmosphere doesn't go away. Um, it stays there forever and, and you know, the only way of cutting, like if you do, eat however many fewer chicken it takes to produce a ton of carbon i don't actually know um if that carbon isn't released it's not going to be there so that's an example of where these kind of small changes do actually make a big difference but yeah and harrod i don't know if you want to come in on that as well 
Yeah, um, well, to second Lily's point, in the four years that I've been vegetarian and vegan, the number of options in supermarkets and high street brands has just exploded. It's so, so, so much easier now than it ever was. And I'm every year I'm so excited for January and all the new veganuary um, products that are in the shops. Love it. But I think it does show that there is power in individual choices. And obviously, like Holly said, you can't go down that super neoliberal perspective of individualism, but it does make a difference. And the way I kind of frame it with like vegetarianism is like a boycott and you can like boycott certain practices. And if you frame it that way, it's a bit more like of an empowering decision that you're making to not fund certain practices that you don't like, whether that be factory farming or not paying workers in the developing world properly. But I think the main point with all of this is to buy less, but buy better. So that's the case for me. And that's the case for, you know, fast fashion and clothing, limit what you buy and make sure that what you buy is better because it will last longer. It's more sustainable. And in terms of money, it will probably even out. So that's, yeah, the main point. You can vote with your wallet and working at fair trade, you do see the power that people choosing things like fair trade has, like the number of companies that come to us in a really supportive and do all of this great stuff like Ben and Jerry's, they do it because they know that people are willing to buy it. So yeah, there is power there, but you know, still write to your MPs and do all of that stuff too. Yeah, I agree. Which actually, um, I would so I'm going to aim to round this up around 8.15. So that quite nicely brings me on to my last question for all of the panellists, um, which is quite a broad question. But it's, uh, we're all very conscious in the Fabians and in Labour that at a government level, we're in opposition. What would you actually, if there's one thing, um, maybe a couple of things that you would like government to do to address all of the issues that we've been talking about tonight. So food poverty, income inequality, carbon, ethics, all of those kinds of things. If there's something that we'd like government to do to be able to change the food system for the better for everybody in the long run, um, what would that be? And that does kind of have the impact of, yeah, going after the system as opposed to putting the onus on individuals. So I'll go for Leonie first on that one, I think. Oh, well, for me, that kind of comes back to where I started from at the beginning and mentioning waste. Um, and um, if you look at the amount of um, food waste uh, and the emissions that comes from it, it's a massive uh, contribution to global climate change. And I think they've estimated um, that if global food wastage was a country, it would be the third largest emitter um, of uh, country emitting um, gases in terms of climate change. So for me, having separate food waste collections to be absolutely mandatory for every single local authority, all 356 of them or whatever it is, around the whole of the country, massively decrease the amount of um, emissions by putting that food into anaerobic digestion and it would also then reduce uh, it would then produce gas which we could then use to heat people's homes so it's a win-win situation so that would be mine and I'm pretty sure the committee on climate change um, when they were talking about getting people to change their diets is also uh, looking at um, food waste as well but separating food waste out collecting it separately absolutely top of my list must be done thank you cool i like it message received um i think i'll go next to lily what's your top ask for the uh for the tory government to change the system but on factory farming um i suppose phase it out over a period of time because you probably can't just straight up go instantly no stop doing it but get rid of it um it is as i said earlier i think the one of the main causes of future enormous existential crises for human beings and that's even not even looking at uh the horrendous level of suffering really on a, a level that we can't even comprehend that goes on purely because of factory farming um i think really bear in mind just think for a second about one billion lives and yeah, these aren't human lives in, the, in terms of the level of sentience and consciousness that we can say that chickens have, but one billion lives spent in filth and pain and fear and confusion. It's just on a level that we can't even understand. It's one of, if not the biggest moral crises of, um, of the 21st century. And 
on top of that, uh, it's breeding ground for future pandemics. It is a huge cause of uh, climate uh, change and just generally a source of inequity across the world. So I'd say get the hell rid of factory farming as soon as possible. Can I very quickly also just make an unrelated kind of point about um, the sort of systemic change versus individual change? Because I just think this is really important and something that I feel very strongly about because I know that people generally think about this in terms of going vegan as kind of Oh, you know, sort of asking individuals to take the burden of the change isn't really fair when you have these huge companies um, responsible for immense amounts of suffering and carbon emissions, etc. Um, but I'd really just like to reiterate that, uh, to be honest, for my organisation, going vegan isn't the main thing that you can do to fight this. It's a big thing that you can do and it's great, but you don't have to be a vegan to be an animal rights activist. You don't have to be a vegan to, you know, fight the system at all. Uh, you know, writing a letter to your MP, if it actually does something, can be as big, if not a bigger, personal decision that you can make. What we want to do is go after the systemic causes of these problems. We're not putting all the onus on individuals to make changes. We love it when they do. It's important to send that signal to companies and to governments that this needs to change. That's why it's important. But it's not all about, it's not all about individuals at all. It's about causing that systemic change. And that's why we want people writing to their MP. We want people um, sending emails to their favorite company telling them you've got to stop treating animals like this. That's a huge important thing to do. Anyway, I've been talking for a really long time, but yeah, just to say so on that with the systemic change being important. Yeah, I love that. And I can see Anne Harrod nodding away, so I won't waste any time. I'll just bring Anne Harrod straight in. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Um, systemic change. We, it, it's, it's weird to talk about individual actions being like not as important but it is the individual action to get involved in the systemic kind of writing to your MP thing that actually does make a difference so don't think of yourself as a powerless actor because you're really not but um, in terms of my big government ask it would be strengthening human rights due diligence and updating the modern slavery act to make sure that the companies that think that they can duck out of these um, sustainability badges is like a nice to have or a money making like what just way of getting people to buy their brand that's not sufficient to make sure that they've got no choice in even the companies that are falling way behind it brought up to a minimum level so that you know in human rights due diligence that can take account of the climate crisis and the impact that will have on human rights and supply chains and it's obviously living wages, living incomes, uh, child labor, which I haven't touched on, which is a huge issue. And, you know, modern slavery is just rife in so many supply chains. And you would be shocked at the number of um, modern slaves that work on like, you know, luxury products like chocolate. So, yeah, it's definitely that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to pick any of those three because I couldn't pick because they're all too good. Uh, and so because I'm the chair and I can, I'm going to say what my top ask would be, um, which is currently the um, agriculture bill is going through Parliament and not to mince my words, I think it's crap. Um, there have been a number of really quite easy things that the government could have put into the agriculture bill and haven't. Um, one of the Sorry, most Holly, is, is that manure or is that chicken <laughs> shit? <laughs> both both also also bullshit as well um there's a lot more chicken shit in the world than any other kinds of shit <laughs> <laughs> Just you that there's a lot of it to go around <laughs> <laughs> well currently there's a lot of it in the agriculture bill um and there have been some quite easy things that they could have implemented and put in the bill which they haven't the most famous one being the chlorinated chicken argument so um, a lot of people, you know, Labour, Luke Pollard included, have been lobbying the government really hard to just commit in legislation to maintaining our standards rather than just saying with nice words on a panel that that's what they will do. And they've refused to do it. Um, another thing which they were asked to do, um, I believe, by Kerry Pollard, the Labour MP, was commit to having a food plan um, to address food poverty as part of the bill. Um, and they refused to do it. The Tory version of tackling... Kerry Kerry McCarthy, Kerry McCarthy, McCarthy. Sorry. No, Kerry, um, Kerry Pollard was a Labour MP for St Albans, yeah. but lost his seat. Kerry yeah. McCarthy is a vegan and represents Bristol East. 
and she's great. I love Kerry McCarthy. I'm sorry, Kerry McCarthy, for getting your name wrong. Um, but the Tory version of tackling hunger is just to open another food bank. And I know we're all in agreement that that's useless too. Um, so that would be, those would be my asks of, of government is just take these really easy, implementable steps um, in the agriculture bill, which could realistically be done tomorrow. Uh, and they're not doing it. We can speculate why, you know, the Americans trade deal, chlorinated tr chicken, et cetera. Um, I won't go into that right now, but realistically they could do it and they are not. Um, I'll give a final opportunity to any of the panelists to come back if you want to have any final comments um, before we wrap up. Speak now if ever hold your peace, if you've got anything more that you haven't managed to say. Write to your MP, particularly if you have a Conservative MP, to pick up all of the points that Holly has just made about this chicken shit um, agriculture bill um, it, it, and actually even write to your MP if you're, you've got a Labour MP but certainly try and challenge that now um, and also write to your local authority and or the Mayor of London um, and say you know why aren't you doing separate food waste collections and if there are separate food waste collections write and ask are they using um, anaerobic digestion to get rid of it because there's no point collecting it separately and then shoving it in a hole in the ground with garden waste yeah agreed anyone else want to come in with some final comments or can we can we wrap up just to say thanks so much for having me and uh, this has been really interesting could i share my email for anyone because i'm seeing there are some there are some kind of comments and questions where it seems like i'd, I'd like to carry on this conversation and stuff so should i should i type it is now yeah, even the time for that <laughs> It, just post it in the chat um yeah and if and when i do like a follow-up blog post or something i'll uh, i'll include contact details or alternatively if anyone needs to get in touch with lily then just get in touch with me via the environment network and i can put you in touch as well yeah great just thanks so much it's been really nice chatting to you all and hearing your questions thank you okay so without further ado thank you very much for attending everyone enjoy what's left of the bank holiday monday um, and have a good week. Thank you for coming. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank Cheers. You. Bye bye. Bye. bye.